Welcome to First Baptist Fairdale this morning. Glad to have you with us today. We're excited to worship. As you're getting situated, I want to invite you to turn in your Bible to Psalm 49. Psalm 49 is going to be our call to worship. <laughs> And a couple announcements for you, just to remind you, you may have noticed we've got a lot of Operation Christmas Child shoeboxes around the church still. Those are actually due t today. Uh, if you've not done one yet, it is not too late. You can still take one today. You can fill it up this afternoon uh, and bring it back this evening. And we will be taking them at some point uh, throughout this next week uh, to the distribution center where they're all going to be uh, sent out from there. And so even if you can't get it here until maybe tomorrow, you can still bring it, all right? And our goal for the whole church is 225. Obviously, as they start to come in, we'll count them, but we don't know where we are uh, on that goal yet. But those are due today. Please, 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 if you can, still bring one and fill one. All right, we are also going to have a men's prayer breakfast this coming Saturday. Uh, it's November the 20th. That's at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the following week, when the, the ladies would typically have one, will not happen this month, okay, based on the, the holidays coming up. Also, we do have a ladies' Christmas culture exchange that uh, this happens every year. I believe we did not do it last year, uh, but we are doing it this year. It's going to be December the 11th, so ladies, make sure you put that on your calendar uh, so you can be there for that. And make sure you're looking at your bulletin so you don't miss what else is going on, but that's all that I'm going to highlight for you today. But let's look now at Psalm 49, and let's let the words of the psalm prepare our hearts for worship. Hear this, all peoples. Give ear, all inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak wisdom. The meditation of my heart shall be understanding. I will incline my ear to a proverb. I will solve my riddle to the music of the lyre. Why should I fear in times of trouble when the iniquity of those who cheat me surrounds me? Those who trust in their wealth and boast of the abundance of their riches. Truly no man can ransom another or give to God the price of his life. for The ransom of their life is costly and can never suffice. That he should live on forever and never see the pit. For he sees that even the wise die and the fool and the stupid alike must perish and leave their wealth to others. Their graves are their homes forever, their dwelling place to all generations. Though they called lands by their own names, man in his pomp will not remain. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the path of those who have foolish confidence. Yet after them, people approve of their boasts. Like sheep, they are appointed for Sheol. Death shall be their shepherd, and the upright shall rule over them in the morning. Their form shall be consumed in Sheol with no place to dwell. But God will ransom my soul from the power of Sheol, for he will receive me. Be not afraid when a man becomes rich, when the glory of his house increases. For when he dies, he will carry nothing away. His glory will not go down after him. For though while he lives, he counts himself blessed. And though you get praise when you do well for yourself, his soul will go to the generation of his fathers who will never again see light. Man in his pomp, yet without understanding, is like the beasts that perish. Let's pray. What a reminder that we have read this morning, Lord. <clears throat> that in this life we may possess a lot of things, have a lot of wealth, even have others speak well of us, but we cannot carry those things on into death. God, those things will become another's. And we are reminded that that is a worthless pursuit to, to search after those things. God, we are also reminded that those who trust in you will not be put to shame. God, we should not fear in times of trouble, but we should put our hope and our faith and our trust in you, knowing that you will provide. And God, we are thankful that as you have given us your son Jesus, and that as we look to him, then our life has, has meaning and purpose. And 
we have eternal life in him. Something that can never be taken away from us. God, as we worship you this morning, keep our eyes focused on Christ. Keep our eyes fixed on the founder and the perfecter of our faith. God, help us not to waver. Help us not to get caught up in being focused on all these other things. God, we are thankful for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray this morning. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Would you stand and sing with us? and astounding to tell forever existing in worlds above now offered and given to all no fountain of beauty eternal the father the spirit the son sufficient and endlessly generous magnificent marvelous matchless love The seasons rejoice in your faithfulness. All life is sustained by your hand. You crown every meadow with colors. You paint every shade in the sky. Each shade the dawn wakes is an uncle Magnificent, marvelous, that's just love. And now great, how sure. His love in us forevermore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. What grace that you entered our brokenness. You came in the fullness of time. Our Father had fallen from righteousness, but not from the mercies of Christ. Your cross is our door to redemption. Your death is our fullness of life. That day I forgive the slowness of the magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. How great, how sure. Love in us forevermore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. United in your resurrection, you lift us to infinite heights. Good Ever will take us from magnificent, marvelous, matchless love, and how great, how sure His love in us forevermore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love, and how great. standing and greet one another.
Would you return to your seats as we continue in song? Be 
don't know what a log looks like on the inside, but that first cut with the sawmill, you can brush off the sawdust and it's a unique grain pattern, color pattern uh, in that log. When I walk around the piece of property that I'm just a steward of, some of these hybrid poplars that I planted 30 years ago, it is humbling for me to understand, oh, I planted those trees without understanding the reason why. And here we are uh, producing many cars with that wood for Operation Christmas Child to share the love of Jesus. Got some more cars for you. All right, this is 4,900. 99. Yep. And this makes the 20,000th car. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Who would have thought 30 no. years ago in a print shop? <laughs> I started working with Steve Shattuck in the mid 80s, and we've been good yeah, friends like for that whole time. He got involved with Samaritan's Purse maybe five, six years ago. And he says, Ken, you gotta look into this operation, Christmas Child. And we packed shoeboxes for the first time three years ago. Every box that leaves Operation Christmas Child has a gospel opportunity in it, and that's why we're connected to it. So we strive to be able to create a quality product in the context of that gospel opportunity being presented. So the two go hand in hand. And I challenged him with these cars, what can we do? And he took it and ran with it. We thought with our ability to make wooden products that you know we could do something a little nicer for the kids. And Steve challenged me to make a car. And I said, what dimensions? And I built some prototypes. So we came up with the design that we have today. Said, how many do you think you might need? Oh, and he says, well, maybe 10,000. I'm like, wow, that's a big number. Well, at first hearing the number of 10,000, I thought, well, of course it's 10,000 because Steve and Ken really um, challenge each other, sometimes ridiculously. Um, and I, so I thought this was a ridiculous challenge. But Ken did not think it was. And thankfully, he didn't because he figured out how to do it. Um, so we did 10,300 last year. We also had a challenge this year of 20,000, and we met that goal last week. My father's seen the process, and he said, well, I'd like to be part of it. And uh, he's been able to do 17,000 plus. <laughs> it's hard to imagine. And I think it should be added that his dad is 91 years old. So. <laughs> the wood is unique. And each one of the cars that are produced from a log has a different grain pattern, pattern of the knots. Each car is individual. And each child that gets a car uh, can appreciate that it's special for them. The cars that, that we make here might be the first gift that some children receive. So that makes it even more important to us that we make it very durable and lasting and small so it can fit into a pocket. I feel so humble in that it's such a little item but could have a large impact. It is an expression of God's love through us to the kids and that's my prayer. The Operation Christmas Child shoebox is, is in the millions. Maybe we can encourage another woodworker across the country that we could hit a million cars in a season to put in boxes. So that is one of my goals also. Christmas Child videos have been really, really good, and I hope that, uh, that you guys are 
enjoying them and that you're inspired when you see what people are doing to, to bless children around the world. Uh, obviously, today is our last day of collecting uh, our Christmas boxes, so uh, hope that you've had an opportunity to stuff one and, and bring it. Uh, if not, uh, we'll, we'll, I guess, extend that through maybe this evening or tomorrow morning, so you'll have an, a chance to do that. Um, but we're going to read now in, uh, in God's Word. We're going to look to Galatians, and we'll read uh, chapter 6, 1 through 5 for our scripture reading. Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Brothers and sisters, if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual, restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. Carry one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Let each person examine his own work, and then he can take pride in himself alone, and not compare himself with someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. Let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the teacher. Please join me in prayer. Lord God, we thank you and we praise you for this day. We thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, and we pray that that truth would be applied to our hearts, that it would change our hearts, Lord, that it would make us more like your son, Jesus Christ, and that it would cause us to live in such a way, Lord, that we would desire to share that same truth that we've received with others. We pray, Lord, that as we do that, that we would share that truth in love, that we would love others and show others the love of Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would drive us, that you would stir us up, that you would encourage us as we do that. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to seek to bear each other's burdens, as your word has said here this morning, that you would help us to see brothers and sisters in need, and that we would come alongside them, Lord, and love them. Lord, we thank you that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to take our burdens and bear them for us. Lord, because we know that there's nothing that we can do to make atonement for to redeem ourselves, Lord. We needed you to act on our behalf. And we thank you, Lord, that you acted through sending your son to die on the cross for our sins, relieving us of our burden, relieving us of condemnation, relieving us from the guilt and shame of sin. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to fully trust in what the completed work of Christ is, who Christ is. We pray, Lord, that we would look forward to his coming. And we thank you, Lord, that as we move into a holiday season where we're offering thanks and being thankful and we're looking forward to Christmas as we celebrate your coming Lord we pray that we would also remember that you are not done working yet that there are more to be saved Lord and you will return for us and you will take your church home to be where you are so we pray Lord that you would help us to remember those things to be encouraged by those things we pray that you would help us to seek to love each other it's in Christ's name we pray amen amen you stand as we continue to sing.
bless our offering. <clears throat> Dear Lord, we do praise you for being the great God that you are. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house today. I thank you, Lord, that you died on the cruel cross for our sins. And Lord, I just pray for this waiting congregation. I pray if someone here today doesn't know Jesus as the Lord, that today will be their day, that they'll accept you as their Savior. Now, Lord, I ask you to bless this offering and your ongoing work. I ask you, Lord, to, to bless it and use it according to your will. In Jesus' name I pray. you all enjoyed that. Um, that is a glimpse into the uh, fall retreat that we took uh, our students on, not this past weekend, but the weekend before. Um, and it was uh, sort of the first event of its kind. Um, we took 18 kids and it was a 24-hour uh, getaway where we had the opportunity to do some of the fun things you guys saw like archery tag and dodgeball and s'mores and whatever else. And whoever convinced me to play basketball in like 30 degree weather. Um, so, uh, but, but beyond that, it was also an opportunity for us to get away as a student group to grow the, the friendships and the Christian relationships that we have for 24 hours and to sit under the preaching of God's word three different times in 24 hours and to observe encounters with Jesus. The theme for the weekend was encounter and we got to um, to, to see the kind of impact that happens when, when people come to encounter Jesus, um, regardless of who they are or what their background was. And so that was uh, a really cool and fun opportunity. We're very grateful for our speaker who came and, and preached to us, and, and that weekend was really impactful. And so um, we, are, we are hopeful and we are uh, praying that we will be able to do it bigger and better next year. Um, and we look forward to how God is going to use and continue to use um, small events and, and, and getaways like that for our students. And so uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed that. I know your students hopefully did. And uh, we look forward to doing more things like that in the future. So thank you.
Arth is doing a fantastic job with student ministry. I actually got a text this week from the parent of a child in the youth group, and that parent, uh, that text said that uh, this child thinks that Garth is an amazing youth pastor. So that's awesome, uh, and, and they're not the only ones that think that. So we want to do a couple things for pastoral prayer today. We want to pray for our, our youth ministry, but also our kids' ministry, uh, but then also for the shoeboxes. As they are due today, and we're going to be sending them off this week, we want to be praying that uh, God would use those in a big way. Uh, we fill those every year, and hopefully you all are praying for those as you're filling them and as you're bringing them here to the church. Uh, and those videos are great. Don't get me wrong. We love those videos. Those are awesome. But you don't need to be a grandma who sews, you know, handmade dolls to make an impact with Operation Christmas Child. And you don't need to be a woodworker who's got this awesome, uh, you know, woodworking shop in their backyard to make an impact with shoeboxes for Jesus. You can be an ordinary person just like just about everybody in here working a normal job with everyday responsibilities. And you just take some time and a little bit of your money to fill up one of those shoeboxes and you can make an, if an impact. You can make a difference. And so we want to be praying for the shoeboxes as well. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you so much that as, as our church here grows, we have people like Garth and Emily and, and Matt and Liz who lead up our youth and children's ministry. And we think about Mary Catherine as well who, who leads the nursery. God, we want to think about all of the young people here at our church. God, we're, we're thankful so much for uh, this fall retreat that Garth was able to put together with the youth. And we are so thankful that it went well, that the kids were able to hear the gospel multiple times <clears throat> over just the course of 24 hours. And God, we pray that you would be using events like this, where kids are away from home, they're away from uh, the norm, and you would get them in an environment where they can hear the word of God and that it can work on their hearts. And God, we understand uh, that the changing of somebody's heart is a work that you do. It's not a work that we do. We can't, we can't make that happen. And so we pray and we ask that you would be the one at work in drawing these students to yourself, in forming them into the image of Christ, doing that work of sanctification. God, I pray that as, as the year goes on, as we go into the holidays and into the new year, uh, that you would continue to provide opportunities for things like this, where we can get students away and, and continue to preach the truth to them. But God, I pray that it would continue to happen in everyday conversations between church members and youth, whether they're youth leaders or whether they're just members here at our church. All of us can have an impact on young people if we are intentional to speak the truth to them, to share the gospel with them, even in regular conversation. God, we want to pray for these shoe boxes, as it is our goal this year to have 225 boxes filled and sent out from our church. God, I pray that you would help us to reach that goal, but more importantly than that, I pray that those who do fill up a box would understand that this box can, can change a child's life that we may never meet until heaven. God, I pray that we would understand that you can use these boxes in ways that we've not even considered. Now, the Bible tells us that you are able to do far more than all that we can even ask or think. And so, God, I pray that you would help us to understand how big you are. And, God, help us to understand that just filling a box with, with some little toys and trinkets and knowing that when these boxes are presented to children on all, all places in the world, that they're going to hear the good news of the gospel. They're going to hear about Jesus. They're going to hear that he died for their sins and that if they will trust in him, they will be forgiven. They will be eternally comforted, as Thessalonians says. God, I pray you'd help us to be faithful to do something like filling up one of these boxes. God, we pray that you would use them for a gospel impact wherever they end up in the world. God, use them to draw people to yourself. God, we are thankful now that as we are about to turn our attention to the preaching of the word, we are thankful that you are a God who has not kept silent, but you're a God who has spoken. And we have a book with 66 books in it, which is your word to us. And I pray that as Josh comes now to preach to us, I pray that we would have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to understand. And as the psalmist says, 
pray that you would open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things from your law. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. If you would, turn to the Bible to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. We are coming to the end. We are almost there. And today's passage is going to be one uh, that's going to catch your attention. You don't hear a lot of sermons on this. It's going to be good for us. You know, there's a, there's a lot of thought out there, no, short of a pen, no shortage of opinion on the, the state of the church, Christianity. And I want to encourage you guys today that God has not changed. The Lordship of Christ has not changed. And God is working in His church. It's a special time for the church. And, and here's why. When I say the church, I mean all, all believers. And here's why. For the past several generations, especially here in America, especially here in the, in, in, in the, in the southeastern United States of America, there has been such an emphasis on work ethic, hard work, men and women who knew nothing other than to just work from sun up to sundown. And that's a good thing, work ethic is. But this church suffered from that. And Bible teaching was not very strong. We had hard working people, but we had people that didn't know what the Bible says. Discipleship was lacking. But in recent generations, really in the last 30 years, Bible teaching and discipleship and the emphasis on following Christ at His Word is excelling. So what we have now, okay, and this is not a discouraging thing, this is exciting as can be. What we have now all over the place, all over this country, all over this city, and truly all over the world are young leaders who are motivated by our dads and moms and our grandparents' work ethic with a deep love for this book in our hands and in our hearts saying, let's go and make disciples. It is a beautiful thing. Do not be discouraged about what's going on in the life of the church. Work ethic is on the increase in Christian discipleship because we are seeing what the Bible tells us to be like and our parents and grandparents have paved the way with work ethics like the world has never seen. I am thankful, so thankful for a mom and dad who I hope are even watching right now from the day I was born have modeled for me, work your butt off. There is no time to rest. And that has been ingrained into my life. But I'm also thankful that when I became a Christian, and especially when I became a committed follower of Christ in my late teenage years and on into college, that I got into some awesome, awesome discipleship, church, Bible teaching, faithful pastors who poured and poured and poured this book into me. And so now what we have going on in the world are people who are burdened to work hard, to sacrifice, to work and believe the Bible, know the truth, follow Christ. This is where we're at and this is in many ways what our passage is about today. The Bible, folks, is so good for us. There are many aspects of our lives that are addressed and taught from God in the Bible. And we must, as believers, be committed to it. We must believe that the Bible is the true Word of God delivered to us as His revelation to us. And we are to live this life and have our understanding and knowledge of this life based off God's true Word. In our commitment to it, we must desire to learn from God. We must want God to guide us in how we should go. We must be people who say, whatever I'm trying to do in this life, I want to do it in a way that honors God. And God is informing me on how I will do what I'm doing through His Word. 
my first ever job in a restaurant I was uh, third year of college in Greenville South Carolina and when it wasn't basketball season I was waiting tables at a restaurant in downtown Greenville South Carolina I remember one night waiting tables can be kind of crazy and you're running around and you're in and out of the kitchen and all that and I remember one time I ran to the kitchen I said I need a cold plate please I just needed the guy to hand me a cold plate so I could run it out to the table and when I said uh, I need a cold plate please he said well here you go ask and you shall receive I said, thanks, man. I love it that you're quoting the Bible. He said, what? I said, yeah, you're, you're quoting the Bible. Thanks for the plate. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, asking you shall receive is in the Bible. Those are the words of Christ. And he's the first person to have said that, and you just said that to me. He didn't know that, though. But in my mind, I was thinking Bible, truth, and wanting that to be lived out. See, what I'm trying to get us to see this morning is that the Bible is God's word to us. That you and I would hear it and believe it, and then it would be pushing us in what we do and in how we do what we do. That's what this is about this morning. If you look with me at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're going to start reading in verse 6. Before we read, though, I want to say something that we, we remind ourselves often around here that life is hard. Life is difficult. And the reason why is because life comes with many burdens. We are short on funds at times. We have health concerns at times. There are things that upset us. Life is filled with burdens. Our passage today is about burdens in life and how we navigate those and what we are going to do about it. But we must say before we get into the passage that there are burdens in life that we can control and burdens in life that we cannot control. And you're going to need to understand the difference here today. Carrying each other's burdens allows us a beautiful and wonderful opportunity for us to live out our faith, to be a blessing in each other's lives, to be helpful and serving and loving, to care for one another. But... Unnecessary burdens often do the opposite. And this is going to be the tension here today, and I need you to listen and pay attention and to understand the difference there. Unnecessary burdens do the opposite. They don't help. They hurt. They disrupt. They create disunity. When it's so important for people of God to be united, they create disunity. Today's passage is about this very thing. It's about burdens and idleness and laziness and work ethic and lives that honor God and lives that help others. You may have never heard a sermon like this before, and I promise you the pastors didn't get together and come up with this topic. It was not on our radar. We just walked through the Thessalonian books this time, and 2 Thessalonians brings it up. Read with me, if you will, chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, beginning in verse 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. That's awkward, isn't it? That's a tense subject. This is why I began by saying that the Bible is so good for us. You and I need to allow God and his message 
speak directly into our lives. Bible should not be shut up in our homes. It shouldn't be left in our car. They should be read. They should be sought. They should be looked at so that we would understand what God has us to know. One of the cool things about life is that when people live out faithfulness to the ways of God, we learn them through people's lives. There are lots of things in our lives that we know, we believe, we are convinced of because we've seen it in the lives of other people. We didn't even know that the Bible said that. What a blessing that has been in many of our lives when we've seen faithfulness. Some of you all had never, even right now, never heard the Bible speak towards work ethic. But you know work ethic because you have been taught that from a coach or from a parent or from adversity or from an upbringing. We could go on with many subjects. When you've seen somebody be married for a long time, 50 some years, we admire that. We know there have been obstacles and trials and hard times and ups and downs, and we appreciate that. You may not have even known that the Bible teaches us that that should be the case. We should be committed to one another and hold fast to each other. And yet we admire that because we've seen it in the world. This is the way truth works sometimes. We can learn it from God's book, and we can also learn it as we have seen it lived out. Well, here in 2 Thessalonians, it appears that in the Thessalonian church, there was an issue of idleness. It seems that way because this subject comes up in both letters. 1 Thessalonians 2.9, 2.9, 1 Thessalonians 4.11, 1 Thessalonians 5.14. Now we're into 2 Thessalonians, and it's here as well. Apparently, in the Thessalonian church, there were a lot of people who were not working. They were not contributing. They were uh, existing off the others, but not doing their part. And it's interesting how the uh, churches that we learn about in the book of Acts and through the letters that Paul has written kind of find their way, right? We all know about the Corinthian church and how it was known for the sexual morality. And we can even think of the specific cases of sexual morality that are listed in First and Second Corinthians. But with the Thessalonians, there's very little, if any, mention of sexual morality. There's a huge discussion about the return of Christ and has it happened or has it not. But there's several mentions in First and Second Thessalonians about idleness. In that town, Thessalonica, there were believers, okay, who were idle and they should not have been. And so he's addressing it. At the outset here, I want to remind you that they were believers. He calls them brother. This doesn't mean they're not Christians. This doesn't mean they're not saved. It doesn't mean they're not trusting in Christ for salvation. It means that they're wrong in the way they are being idle. And so he is encouraging them to stop being idle, all right? This is what happens in the Christian life. Many of us struggle in different ways. And what we need in our lives is for somebody else that follows Christ to come along and push us or help us or hold us accountable or call us out or encourage us to step forward in obedience in that area. You should welcome that in your life. You should not be defensive and not allow anybody to. You should be humble and allow people to speak into your lives. That is the way church is. Do not be so sensitive that if anybody dares bring up anything to you, you can't handle it and you'll be done with them. And do not quit church because somebody tries to lovingly hold you accountable. Do not fight back and be argumentative or defensive because somebody cares about your relationship with God. Be able to take that. Again, this is what good parenting should teach you all your life. You should be able to be got on or kicked in the pants or called out because it's for your good. Let your boss do that. Let your coaches do that. Let your brothers and sisters in Christ do that. And Paul does this in love to the Thessalonian church. The issue here is idleness. I want to give you two points, and I'm going to tread lightly, and I hope you get it. The first is a call to separate from the idol. A call to separate from the idol. And the second is a call to imitate the hardworking. Two points, a call to separate from the idol and a call to imitate the hardworking. All right? Now, you can see here that this is the, uh, the, the issue. In verse 6, 
you have somebody walking in idleness, a brother who's walking in idleness. In verse 7, you have, uh, we were not idle when we were with you. And then in verse 11, we hear that some among you walk in idleness. So that's clearly the issue. You have the same word three times right here in this passage. This word idle or idleness has a bigger meaning. It does not just mean standing still, right? I-D-L-E, idle, often for us means do, you know, doing nothing. But it, it, sometimes it's great for you to just do nothing, right? And you take a break, right? That's good. Uh, but this means to being idle in a way that is disruptive. And that word disruptive has to go along with your thinking of idle today. That's what the meaning of the word is. So it's idle in the sense of being disruptive, right? That's, that's the issue here in the Thessalonian church. And the calling from Paul to the church is to keep away from them. That's why my first point is a call to separate. Look at verse 6. Now we command you, that's why I said it's a calling, it's a command, brothers and sisters in Christ, in the name of our Lord Jesus, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness. That's strong, is it not? Strong. Separate from them. Now, we've got to be careful here to not think that means ghost them or be done with them or forget about them or avoid them altogether or hate them or not love them. It is not meaning anything like that. It is meaning that there needs to be a shift in the relationship so as to point out the sinfulness in idleness. There needs to be some sort of a change in your relationship so as to point out the sinfulness of idleness. If you didn't hear that, then you're not going to understand everything else today. Something has to change in the relationships of Christians if one is sinning and the other doesn't do anything about it. Now, we could say that with any sin— we are not to continue in sin. Jesus Christ died for our sins. We do continue sinning, but we repent of our sins. We confess our sins. We turn to God and ask for forgiveness of our sins. If a believer is not willing to repent of his sins, he must not be trusting in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And so we are greatly concerned that they may not be saved and on their way to heaven. And so, we have to deal with it. And one of the ways to deal with it is to have a change in the relationship. And here he says to keep away from them. But he says brother. He says restore them. He says encourage them. All right? So he's not talking about done with them. Well, I mean, that was five years ago and I haven't talked to them since. Why? Because they didn't have a job? No, he's not meaning anything like that. He's meaning a relationship that you have, that you're going to continue to have, that needs a changing in it so as to clarify, hey, we think this is a problem in your faith with Christ. There is a sin here that needs to be addressed. And this time, it's idleness. Now, just because in our context, this is such a huge issue, and it just is. This is a big deal in our world today. I want you to turn and look at verse 10 real quick. For a little bit of clarity. He says in verse 10, For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. Now, everybody see that? Now that's strong right there, but I like it. I like that. But notice that he says, if you're not willing to work, okay? Which lets us know that you could be working. Okay? You could be working. You could be contributing to the work, right? It's kind of like here, here, here this afternoon, we're not doing it this afternoon, but let's say this afternoon, I said we need, hey, we need 10 strong-bodied people to carry every one of these shoe boxes downstairs into the truck. And nobody got up to help. And so now it's just me over here making all of these trips, taking all these boxes, right? Then there's some people we'd say, no, you stay seated. Come on, going up and down those stairs is going to be too much for you. Hey, carrying those heavy boxes is going to be too much for you. But there's some people that we'd be going, you can carry some boxes. Get up and get over there and help us, right? So it's this idea. You could be working. You could be contributing. You could be involved in what's happening in the world for the sake of Christ, and you're not. Okay? 
So I'm not here today to say who's in that category and who's not. And really none of us are. But you as an individual need to know that. And that is between you and God starting off. So number one, a call to separate from the idol. Well, in this passage, we have three clear reasons why this is such a big deal. Number one, idleness creates an unnecessary burden. Look at verse 8. Look at verse 8. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Hey, life's hard, isn't it? It's hard to keep paying the bills. It's hard to keep putting food on the table, right? It's hard to look around at all the needs in the world and keep doing that. But I'm going to tell you right now, because of what the Bible teaches us, we want to. I can say that in front of you all, all day long, 24-7, that it is my desire and our desire to help everywhere we can. And I mean it. I mean that. We want to feed. We want to serve. We want to love anybody that we can. And I don't even think there's any hypocrisy in us saying that. I mean that. We want to do whatever we can for anybody. On the drop of a dime, I got a word this week that the middle school down the road did not have a way to feed some kids after school. And so right there on the spot, we found a way without any plan to get food to them. We want to do that. And nobody knows about that. It wasn't announced. We didn't put it on the sign. We didn't put it on social media. We just did it. That's what we want to do. That's our heart, okay? We want to. But let's, uh, let's recognize that there is a lot of burden in the world. And so you think, man, the task is large. There's a lot out there to try to do. Well, those who can be helping are to be helping so that the burden's not getting bigger by people that could be helping eliminate the burden. That's the first thing. Idleness creates an unnecessary burden. If the people that can be working are now being a part of the burden, then we've got things out of order. First thing is it creates an unnecessary burden. Paul says, hey, we work night and day so that we wouldn't be a burden. He didn't want to burden the Thessalonian church. He wants the Thessalonian church to be serving in Thessalonica to help with burdens. That's the first thing. I remember years ago when I was a youth pastor, I quit being the youth pastor in 2009. I thought it was awesome that one of y'all sent a text to our former youth pastor about how great the new youth pastor is. That was awesome. Jake, you handled that well, too. And Garth, kudos to you, man. That's awesome. You always want the next guy to be better than you anyway, so good job. But I remember when I was the youth pastor, we had some people uh, call us up and say, hey, I need the leaves raked in the yard big time. If you'll find me some, some good teenagers, I'd love to pay them if they come bag them up. I said, oh, we could do that. I'll find you, find you a couple of youth. They'll come over there. You don't even have to pay them. They said, no, we want to pay them. I said, okay. And I was about to get it lined up. And I, this is a true story. They said, hey, don't send such and such kid. He's lazy. They're talking about a kid. They say, hey, don't send him. I I don't want him. He's lazy. I've observed him. He don't work. He won't help. I need to get these leaves up. Send me some kids that'll work, and I'll pay them. Whether that's right or wrong, I don't know, but that's the way life is, is it not? Hey, if you're not going to work, don't come to the place where work's happening. Hey, if you're not going to contribute, don't come to the place where people are sweating and hurting their backs off trying to make a contribution. That's the way life is. Whether you like that or not, that's the reality. I can't blame somebody for saying, hey, it's a big task to get the leaves up out of the yard. Don't send somebody that's going to stand here and waste our time. We need to get these leaves up. And so idleness, when there's work to be done, does create an unnecessary burden. The second thing about the call to separate from the idol is idleness creates disruption among the church. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Now this works in English and it works in Greek because Paul is using a word here that sounds alike that means two different things. He says, hey, you're not busy working, but you're busy at something. You're not busy working, but you're busy at something. And busybody means this, okay? Here's what busybody means. It's a person who pries into or meddles in the affairs of others. Now that everybody's got Wi-Fi, listen, 
the more that you sit at home and not do anything, the more you just check out social media. It's unbelievable how everybody in the world knows every, everything that's going on. And I'm thinking, how did you have time to do all that? How did you have time to know all that? I remember when I was a kid one time, as an annoying teenager, I was asking my dad about this at the mall and this at the mall, some new clothes around or some new basketball shoes I was trying to get or whatever. And my dad telling me, hey, if, you, if somebody would go to work and take care of their chores and come home and take care of all they got to do, they're not going to know about everything that's new in the mall and new with fashion and new shoes. They ain't got time for all that. And I remember thinking, that's a pretty good point. And the same thing applies here. If your hands to the plow and you're doing everything that you've got to do, right? Don't you have laundry to do at home and dishes to do, right? Don't you have to be on your knees at some point praying to God? Don't you have to sit down and have a deep conversation with your kids about what's going on, right? Don't you have a neighbor that you need to go and serve? Doesn't the trash can need to be brought up? Doesn't the grass need to be mowed? Don't you have to check on the neighbor next door that's struggling? Aren't there all of these things out there to do? And so not as much time for us to meddle in what's going on with everybody else? keeping up with the Joneses and the latest and all of that. And so what happens inside of Christianity in, in the church is it kind of creates this disruption where lots of people are doing things that they're supposed to be doing, and then there's other people that aren't that are getting caught up in things. And he says here they're meddling in the affairs of everybody else. They know what's going on here. They know what's going on there. They've got opinions instead of just being about it. There's a lot to do. There's a lot to do. And it creates disruption. The third thing is that idleness discourages those who aren't idle. It just does. It discourages those who are hard working. You know, often you'll hear in an organization, not just in the church, but you'll hear in an organization that 10% of people do 90% of the work, right? You've heard that before. 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And something's not right about that. Now, we do need to realize that everybody's got a different schedule. We can't expect a, you know, a, a nursing mom at home, or we can't expect an elderly person who's in bad health to be able to do as much. And so you need to stay your lane and know what you're able to do. Some people right now have a lot of free time, and some people have none. Some people right now have a lot of back strength. Some people have none, right? And so we've got grace and understanding in that way, and every church is a little bit different in the, in the makeup of their people. But let's also be honest that if there is something to do and some people that just don't want to do it, and so there are other people who are trying to do it and the burden falls more so on them than it should, that is discouraging. So the Bible tells us that idleness creates an unnecessary burden, it creates disruption among the church, and it discourages those who are not idle. So what do we do? We are to separate from that person. We are to make sure that this is made aware. It's a church discipline, if you will. It's an accountability. A conversation needs to be had. A change in that relationship needs to show, hey, some of us are over here trying to do this, and some of y'all, some of us are over here not. Okay? Now, here's the thing, okay? The last thing that I want to do is stand up here and give y'all a motivational speech about work ethic. I do not want to do that. But I need, I need all of us to understand that the world needs to know God. Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus is the answer to our sin problem. Jesus is the way to heaven. And it is through Christ that we come to know what life is all about. We come to know how much God loves us and the forgiveness of sins. And everything that this church is doing, whether it's on a Monday, whether it's on a Sunday morning, whether it's here on a Friday night, whether it's here on a Thursday afternoon, because this church is doing things at all of those times, stuff is happening. And in everything that we're doing, it's not to say, hey, look how hard we're working. That's why I'm saying that is not this motivational speech. It ain't about that. But in everything that we're doing, we are pointing out and hoping to proclaim that life is about Jesus. So when we do a wedding, we hope they come to believe in Christ. So when we pass out food, we hope that they come to trust in Christ. So that when we get to do uh, be with sports, we hope that they will come to know Christ. So that when we get to do counseling over a tense issue, we hope that they come to know Christ. So that we can go volunteer anywhere, we hope that they will see the answer in Christ. They will find the purpose to life. That's right. That's the goal. That's what we're about. That's the mission of the church, to point people to Christ. But that happens collectively. And let's just be honest. If these people over here, man, they're the good hardworking, and they know people in the community, 
And these people over here are the idle, and they know people in the community. The people in the community are going, they're hardworking because that's how they were raised, and they're idle because they're lazy sinners, right? And they're not turned on to the truth of Jesus being a Savior. Matter of fact, they're more confused and conflicted by it. The Bible teaches us that believers are not to be idle. We are to see in our everyday lives, whether we are 80-year-olds that volunteer at the church, whether we're 50-year-olds that are working 70 hours a week at Ford, whether we work in the school system, whether we coach the Little League teams, whatever we're doing, we are about helping people find life in Christ. That's what it's about. We want people to know and believe. We want people to know God's way. This is what every bit of it is. The Bible is warning. That when we are disobeying God in any way, even idleness, lazy, not working, contributing, not being helpful, not being supportive, taking advantage of the system, taking advantage, when we are being idle, we are a problem in it. And I wonder, in a little old town like South Louisville, where everybody's connected with two degrees of separation, you don't need seven degrees of separation, two degrees of separation in South Louisville, everybody knows each other, right? And I wonder how much Christianity, the salvation that's offered through Christ, and the strength of the churches is being hindered by the idleness that we have. Some people give a good testimony, and some people are hurting the witness. This is what was the case in Thessalonica. So he says we've got to address it. So there's a calling there, a command there to separate from the idol. If you're here today and you know that you should be contributing you know that your life is supposed to be pointing towards the work of Christ, then I encourage you to get in step with it. I encourage you to get involved. I encourage you to think about what must I be doing. But please hear me that the message today is not that we work harder to earn anything. I'm so scared that y'all are going to leave out of here thinking that. It's not. We, 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 we don't work to earn anything. We work because we've been saved by Christ and we want our lives to count. We want to make a difference. We want it to contribute. So the flip side of that, the calling to separate from the idol is what he says over and over again, the call to imitate the hardworking. And there's a chance here that it sounds boastful with the apostle. It sounds like Paul is saying, hey, imitate us, except for that we understand in the New Testament that the apostles were that kind of unique situation of being, it went from Jesus to the apostles to the Bible. That's how the word of God came, from Jesus through the apostles to the written word. And so we have that. And so when we see the apostles and we see Paul saying, hey, you need to be like me. You need to do what I do. You need to hear what I say, what I teach, and then go out there and do that. We're not to see somebody who's just a great person. He said he was the chief of sinners. He says over and over again that he's not worthy. Right? We're not to think that he's the hero. Christ is the hero. He's the life changer. He's the one who gives us this purpose. But we are to hear that and say, okay, it's a good example for us. Christians should be those who appreciate good examples. You've got a good mom, we should want to be like our mom. You've got a good Sunday school teacher, you should want to be like your Sunday school teacher. If you look around the church and you see some good parents, you should want to be like those good parents. If you see somebody who's got a good work ethic, you should say, I want to have a good work ethic. Last night we had a wedding here. Of course it's dark and, and all of that. and a, a group text goes out. That says, hey, we need, we need some people to just help at church for just a few minutes. We get over here and a handful of people show up. That sort of helpfulness is so encouraging. And so you think in that situation, now certainly we know it's a Saturday night. We know y'all couldn't make it. We don't want y'all to feel bad that you couldn't make it. That's not what this is about. But for the people that did make it and wanted to make it, isn't that refreshing? Yes. I didn't have to set up anything else. I didn't have to do any of that. People came and did it. That's encouraging. They are to be imitated. They are exemplary. And that's the second point. He makes this point, a call to imitate the hardworking, by saying two things. Number one, we have taught you this with our teaching. Look what it says here in verse 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness. Look what it says next. And not in accord with the tradition 
that you received from us. Paul just goes ahead, and when he says the tradition, he's not talking about just traditions. He's talking about the tradition of the teaching of the truth of the word of God. I said this last Sunday because it comes out there in that passage too. We're not talking about traditionalism just for the sake of that's the way we've always done it. We're talking about being faithful to that which is true, and you see this here. Paul gets real heavy right here, and he says, hey, they're being idle as a disobedience to what we taught you. We taught you, you have to work, you have to contribute, you have to be involved, you have to want your life to count to the witness that Christ is Savior, and so they're being idle against that. Verse seven, he says, you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. So what we have here is a call to imitate the hardworking with their teaching and with their lives. They taught me that, the Bible says that, I see this in the word of God, and I've also learned from my leaders. I've learned from the people in the church. I've learned from the deacons. I've learned from those that serve well how you ought to imitate us. But he says it over and over again. He says in verse 7, we were not idle when we were with you. In verse 8, he says, we didn't eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor, we worked night and day. Now, he had to sleep, so he doesn't literally mean 24-7, but he means we were busy. We were getting the job done. We were trying to contribute. And he goes on and on with this. In closing, I want us to look at the end, though, verse 12. And tonight, we're going to look at verses 13 through 15, and it's actually the same passage. He's going to keep it going. But I want you to see verse 12. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly, and to earn their own living. He's not mad at them. He's not wanting them to feel so low that they can't ever come around again. Not that. He's wanting them to believe and trust that God is really working through each and every one of us, individually and definitely collectively. You've got to believe that. There are people on your street and in your family making opinions about God based off this church. That's truth. That's not just the way it is with church. That's the way it is with everything. There's people on your street and in your family making opinions about politics based off the way you represent them. There are people on your street and on your family making opinions about UK athletics or U of L athletics based off how obnoxious you are. That's the way life goes. It is. But the church is just is not just another organization. We carry the message that helps people find an eternal life. We are to turn people on to the goodness of God. And the Bible is teaching us here, yes, an awkward subject. The Bible is teaching us here that my job and my contributing and my making a difference and my looking for burdens to try to help with the burden in an indirect way is representing the truth or not representing the truth. We ought to care about that. We ought to care about that. Now, Matt read earlier from Galatians 6, where it says in the Bible that we, to, we are to carry one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And I said that at the beginning, we love to meet burdens. We must be able to know the difference between burdens that we can't control and burdens that we can. Got to know the difference. We want to meet burdens. It would make us happy right now if anybody would call us up today and say, hey, man, well, I'm struggling to pay my bill. I've been doing this. C can you help us? We'd say yes. We have money set aside in two different benevolence funds, money that is there and ready, and any time somebody asks, bam, make a phone call, get this approved, bam, we will do it, and we do it every single week all the time. 
Wednesday night, we were busy with church. A lady shows up. She worked. She did not make Dare to Care. It closes at 4.30. She missed it. She gets here at church at 7 o'clock. She eats a hot meal downstairs. We're glad she did. And I said to her, do you need some more food? She said, absolutely. We went down here to the food pantry at 7 o'clock. We loaded up a couple boxes of food, and we took it out to her car and gave it to her. We love feeling or fulfilling or reaching or eliminating burdens. That's what we want to do. But we also have a head that allows us to think through what's a necessary burden and an unnecessary burden. For the sake of Christ, may we be those who are contributing to eliminating burdens and not those who are unnecessarily adding to the burden. May we think about a theology of work. May we be those who work hard. And may you be inspired here today that the good old work ethic unites the truth of Scripture to live lives worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not because we're earning anything. I hope you can tell. I do not want y'all to think you're earning anything. Not with God. We're saved by grace through the finished work of Christ on the cross. But once he saved me, we're ready to go to work for him. Working for him. What can we do to serve him? What can we do to show others how much he loves them? What can we do to get people to see that he will forgive them? That's the difference. May we be a part of that. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the high, serious calling of how to address idleness in the church. God, I pray that we would not be like the Thessalonian church in that way. And I pray, God, that where there are burdens, we would want to help with that with gentleness. Oh, God, I pray that today you would give us sensitive hearts and sound faith and ears to hear so that we're not thinking, man, he's beating me up but that we're thinking, I want to be a part of what God's doing. I want my life to contribute. God, help us with that. God, help us to treat people well. Help us to love and serve. God, help us to be be those who can see burdens and think, I want to make a difference there. Help us to order our lives after faith in Christ to be a part of that. God, help us. May your word speak to us now. In Christ's name we pray, amen. If you're here today and you've not trusted in Christ, you've been thinking more and more and more about earning and earning and earning it and earning it and earning it, and today you were reminded that you cannot earn it. Trust in Christ. Let God set yourself free by saying, I want to be a follower of Jesus. You can do that right now. You can come forward and talk to us, and we will help you trust in Christ and say, it is because of Jesus. If you're here today and you've not been baptized and you need to be, let us know. We want to help you move toward baptism if you are trusting in Christ. If you're here today and you think, man, I, I've not thought much about work ethic as a spiritual conversation. I've not thought much about uh, contributing to all that God's doing in the world. Even as we sing, would you respond to that? Let's sing this last song before we go, and let's get ourselves focused on living together for Christ. Let's sing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
You guys are all encouraged to be back here tonight at 6 o'clock. We will uh, look at the, the final passage in 2 Thessalonians and finish our series on, um, on the two books. And uh, also it will be a final opportunity if you have uh, shoeboxes left over uh, to bring and turn in. If you're just now deciding you want to do one, uh, there are still some empty boxes downstairs by the, by the big map on the wall. Um, and you can bring, again, you can bring those back with you. Um, tonight. We're going to close with uh, the end of uh, Paul's letter to the Galatians. And he's, he's, this is what he says. Uh, and let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith.